To the um, community, family, friends, ulama, especially our dear elders and innocent children. And um, I want to say shukran to the committee, the Imam of Masjid Rawda, for having us here this afternoon uh, at this blessed time uh, of Jum'ah, auspicious time, and for a few moments, inshallah. Uh, we will share together uh, some thoughts and uh, as Sheikh said earlier that uh, we represent African Muslims agency but today I'm just here as a human being. You're a human being, I'm a human being. When we talk about this concept of humanitarian work, I'm often invited to speak about maybe Afghanistan or Lebanon, Mozambique or Malawi or South Africa or many countries, Syria, you know, different places around the world. Uh, but primarily, what is this about? We talk about humanitarian work. Uh, what does humanitarian work mean? And, and uh, brothers and sisters here today, maybe you know, for the next 15-20 minutes as I share with, uh, we share with each other, is maybe just to challenge each other what do we mean by being a humanitarian? Because we have this mentality typically, and I'm, you know, I'm known for being quite frank, so I should apologize up front. Is that I have, we have this, this mentality typically in society that humanitarian means that maybe you're somebody who does charitable work, you give charity to somebody, or you go out and you help other people, so you're humanitarian. Well, here's my thing Allah created every single one of us. And then, of course, He gave us different gifts, different leanings, different interests. So maybe you're a medical professional. Maybe Engineer, maybe a teacher, maybe a truck driver, maybe a, whatever the case is. So why would you have? Why would you be a medical doctor and not a humanitarian, or an engineer, not a humanitarian? And so if you're a humanitarian, you're nothing else. If you're an engineer, you're not a humanitarian. Frankly, that is just something you do because you're good at, you have a passion for, you love doing it, and it brings you risk. It's a means of not giving you risk and sustenance, and you bring service to the community, isn't it? Whether you're an engineer or a teacher, whatever the case is. But you should still be a humanitarian because a humanitarian nowadays simply means a human being helping another human being. So we don't have to go to Afghanistan, although we'll cover some thoughts about that, or Lebanon or Syria or somewhere in Africa where there's poverty stricken everywhere to be a humanitarian. We've learned over the last 18 months, two years, that sometimes the people closest to us, sometimes the people closest to us are the most in need. And I want to start that because we often think, and this is something that I think is close to my heart, is that we often think that when I give my charity, so to speak, or when I give my help to another human being who's struggling, that human being should be in another country somewhere. Then it somehow has more value. Because they're in Syria, or because they're in Lebanon, or because they're in Afghanistan, or because they're somewhere in the world, so that's why I should do with it, and yet we forget our neighbors. Well, why it's probably somebody 100 meters from where we are right now who doesn't have food for tonight. There's probably someone within 5 kilometers of where you live, if not shorter, that is under immense pressure because they can't feed their families. <coughs> and so I want to remind every single one of us that first and foremost, being a humanitarian is not exclusive to somebody who only goes somewhere to help someone. You're a human being, you're alive, I'm alive, which means by definition, as long as Allah gives us breath, as long as we are wake up with breath in us, our job as a humanitarian is not done. It doesn't matter what our profession is, or our job is, or our business is. We have to be conscious front of mind of the ability and the responsibility of helping another human being. And not wait to be called a humanitarian to do that but to do it anyway because we're a human being. And maybe let's remind ourselves that you and I did not choose to be born in a particular family. You did not choose to be born in a particular financial situation, in a particular country, of a particular race, 
of a particular ethnicity, of a particular nationality. You had no choice in that matter. Allah chose it for us. Which means that when someone else is born in another country or in another situation or of a different race or of a different ethnicity or nationality and they suffer because of whatever strife they're going through, whatever reasons around the world, it could have been you and I. It fascinates me how human beings claim superiority over another human being based on race, religion, culture, nationality, ethnicity, all of a sudden we claim superiority because my race is different to yours, my nationality is different to yours, my ethnicity is different to yours, and we claim superiority. And I hate to say this, but this is a fact. Imagine Allah looking down at us, I don't know, my brain works this way. Imagine Allah looking at us and, and just absolutely being horrified by the way we behave as human beings because we choose who we want to help. We don't help indiscriminately. We help based on where the person is from, what their skin color is, what their ethnicity is, what their nationality is, and then we decide how much help we'll give. So I challenge every one of us, be a humanitarian first, before anything else. Before anything else. When we leave here this afternoon, after Jummah, so that was Jummah, let's think about how am I being a humanitarian? And I say all of this to say this because we all have intellectual conversations all the time, isn't it? About things that go on around the world. We talk about Afghanistan. Share brother about Afghanistan. Let me share a couple of thoughts with you. Alhamdulillah, I've been uh, grateful that I've been there now for a few times. Alhamdulillah, because of the work we do. But the point of this is this. If you have not been to a place or lived with some people for a while, you cannot really comment about how those people feel and what they go through. Too many of us sit in our couch and watch the news and watch social media on our phones, etc., etc., and we have comments about the politics and the economics of Afghanistan or Syria or these places, or South Africa or Malawi or Mozambique, and we have comments about it. Often our comments could have completely no basis in fact. And can I share this with you that any decision made, right? and I use the word humanitarian because humanitarian means despite politics, despite economics, despite all of that. When a human being is in need, it is another human being's responsibility if they are able to, to help that human being. Because Allah protect you and I, but the situation could be reversed. And it may be reversed in our lifetime. We see places like Syria, like Afghanistan, for example, was a thriving nation, thriving nation, and then the situations change. And sometimes so rapidly. So as a humanitarian, there's no differentiation. It's no basis on politics or economics or whatever the case is. Too many people are making comments about what goes on in Afghanistan right now. And hey, it doesn't matter to me which side of the fence you sit about it. The, human, the humanitarian crisis. And let's not talk about the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan that's unfolding. There's no such thing as unfolding. It unfolded four decades ago. <coughs> It just so happens that every time something flares up in a place like Afghanistan, media focuses on it, so it becomes a big point of attention. Everybody sees it, and a month or two later, it forgot. As if the humanitarian crisis stopped. And next time there's a conflict, we'll talk about the humanitarian crisis again. But right now, let's carry on. That's what happens. The humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan has unfolded over four decades ago. It was a thriving nation. It is completely destroyed. I was there just in Ramadan, just a few months ago. And I was there earlier in December last year. And then prior to that, the year before. Because the conversation about Afghanistan or Syria or Lebanon or anything, I'll be in Lebanon and Shabbat next week or in 10 days' time in Shabbat to do some work there specifically with orphans, etc. It's a completely destroyed nation, completely destroyed society. People are dying in hospitals daily in Lebanon because there's no electricity. Then there's no fuel for the for the for the for the for the um, generators. So literally, machines switch off the minute the fuel runs out. But we all have intellectual conversation about the politics behind it, and who was right and who did this and who did that. You know who ultimately suffers? The human being. The human being suffers ultimately in every decision that is made. Politically or economically around the world, the average human being suffers. It's almost never in the interest of the average human being. 
when they eat Afghanistan, Lebanon, where they eat different parts around the world, the human cost often is disregarded in decisions being made. So it's not about the intellectual conversation about who's right or who's wrong, who, which side of the fence you sit when it comes to Afghanistan or Syria or any of these places, or South Africa for that matter. We watch what goes on case and all these places sometimes and we, we look at on the news and then we have very highfalutin ideas about who's right and who's wrong. Before we get to who's right and who's wrong, let's deal with the human suffering on the ground. And I've always got to remind myself as a so-called humanitarian, when you're there on the ground, why are you there? You're there to see beyond any of these barriers and see the human being, see the child, see the mother, see the elderly person, see the woman who's being raped, see the person who's being sexually abused for food. And think this could have been my mother, could have been my wife, could have been my child, could have been me. Why is it that this is brought to my attention? You see, us meeting today is no coincidence. We know that. But we don't take it seriously, really. We say we know that. We know it was about plans, everything. But we don't really understand what that means. You see, often when I'm sitting in a place, like I land in Kabul, Afghanistan. Typically, when I first went there, somebody said to me, You feel like you're 100 years back in time. I thought that's not possible. I arrived in Kabul, Afghanistan, and well, that's what I felt. I felt like everything is just like a hundred years back in time. Everything just, you know, just so far back. And how people suffer. You know, 74% of the population of Afghanistan are under the age of 35. 48% are under the age of 15. That means half the country are children. That's why some of the highest child trafficking numbers are in Afghanistan. Why are 74% under age 35? Because what happened to the rest of them? Four decades of conflict. That's what happened to the rest of them. And when you go up the mountains of Kabul, I mean, think about any family, any person, you and I, what do you want? What does anybody human being want in this world? Live in peace, maybe prosper, maybe be comfortable, maybe educate your children, feed your family, have your dignity. That's the basic stuff any human being wants. Maybe pursue some ambitions of yours, but that's like an extra almost. <coughs> but just the basic peace in life. <coughs> Afghan people are no different. They're no different. And every single time a conflict has occurred in Afghanistan, Millions and millions of people have been displaced. <coughs> Ordinary human beings. <coughs> now don't get me wrong, politics are important, economics are important, they all have their place. But not before human life. Not before numbers. We just call it numbers, isn't it? Millions of people. 74%, 48%, these are numbers. I always ask myself when I'm sitting in Afghanistan or I'm sitting in Lebanon next week, when I'm standing, I'm thinking, why did Allah bring me here? Like, I'm not that special. I mean, let's be honest. You're not that special, I'm not that special. Like, Allah doesn't need me to change their situation. Allah can change their situation without you and I. We are not that amazing that we are the ones required, that we have to come from South Africa. Even your neighbor, Allah could change their situation without you. But then you can ask yourself, if you know the situation of your neighbor, why did Allah bring it to your attention? When I was growing up and my father was doing this, he was traveling all over Africa doing this, I used to always very arrogantly as a teenager ask myself, okay, he used to come home and tell us all these stories of these children suffering and dying and, and you know, in all these places in Africa. And I used to think, okay, well, what's it got to do with me? Because you know, we have this mentality of us testing them. And then I started asking myself, wait a second. Who's really the one being tested because of, I'm not that special, Allah doesn't need me to fix that situation. He could have fixed it anyway. But why did Allah bring it to my attention or to your attention today? Why are we here talking about this? Because now it's part of your attention as well. And when Allah brings it to our attention, who's the one really being tested now? Because now, I feel you know, Allah's blessed me, which means now I'm the one being tested. What am I going to do about what I know now? What I've been exposed to? Am I going to do something, or am I going to leave it to somebody else to do it? Let me give you some examples. Because let's bring this down to humanity. When you climb the mountains of Kabul, and this is insane. And just when I was there earlier this year, and you meet a woman, 
you know, talk, takes us five, six hours to get to the top of the mountain. You meet thousands of people along the way who live on the mountains. Why do they live on the mountains? The higher up they live on the mountain, the cheaper it is to live. Because there's no water, there's no sanitation. There's nothing. They have to walk up and down every day. So the higher up they are, the closer they are to the ground, the more expensive it is to live. So the poorest of the people live higher up in the mountains. So elderly people, there's no roads going to the top. You're literally hiking up. So you get to the top and you meet a, a woman there with her three, four children. And when I asked her, when last did you eat? She said, four days ago. So was, I'm curious, how did she get food? Because I always ask these, maybe, questions to wonder, okay, before we came, how were you eat? Like, I mean, surely you were alive, which means you ate something. Somebody fed, like, had to come from somewhere. And then she tells you, well, no, there's a soldier from the bottom of the mountain that comes up every few days, you know, to, to bring some food for me and my children. So initially I thought, well, that's a really wonderful thing, you know, some noble soldier who's deciding that, you know, he knows this family or whatever and would like to come and give them some food every few days. And the more you probe, you realize that he does this for sexual favors. Now you tell me in a two square meter little place on the top of the mountain in Kabul with her four children there next to her. And when you sit there, you wonder, why did Allah show this to me? What are we doing about this, fellow human beings? I met a family, father of, uh, father of six and seven children there, and the father, the mother was still there. The father actually used to go to work normally, trying to feed his family. And there was a suicide attack somewhere, he was collateral damage. That's what the news calls collateral damage. But to that six or seven siblings, it wasn't collateral damage, they lost their father. He was not politically driven or economically driven, he's just trying to be a normal human being. Do what you and I would do to feed our families. But collateral damage, you see. I arrived in Kabul and that day I arrived, 23 rockets were fired into Kabul. I don't care who fired, it's irrelevant. Yeah, we can have intellectual conversations about it. And in some way it's important at some point. But an 11 year old boy is the recipient of one of those rockets. And he ends up in hospital burned from head to toe. Skin burned completely off. Then you realize the human suffering of these decisions that get made and our intellectual conversations we have. And in that hospital, in Kabul, they don't have a skin grafting machine. So the doctors you take a scalpel to graft skin. The place where we stayed in Kabul, every time we come there, we ask the first time, and I came there the second or third time, they remembered me from the last time, so I asked them how they're doing, etc., etc. And they said, okay, you know, we're doing, we're doing all right. And I said, well, how are things going? And they said, well, you know, we're just glad to be alive. Every day when they come to work, they check that their colleagues are alive. If the night before nothing happened, okay, then today, alhamdulillah, we're back at work. When I talk about children, drink out of sewage, raw sewage, I don't think you and I would understand it unless you physically see it. Because when you physically see it as you're climbing the mountain, you see the raw sewage, literally the raw sewage, from wherever they're defecating, running down, and children drinking the surface water. You know, when the sewage settles a little bit, there's water on the top. And the children drink that. Many situations of husbands who leave their families on the mountains of Kabul, come back there in a few months, to abuse their wives, do whatever they want to do, and then leave again. And then the next few months, the wife will be find a way to support herself. How? You know, they're anticipating right now by December this year, 98% poverty will be in Afghanistan. It's not about whose fault it is. We can debate that forever. We've proved, we, history has proven that human beings don't really care about other humans. Over four decades in that country has destroyed every possibility of them thriving. So whether you believe this is right, this is wrong, this is better, these people are better, those people are not better, it's all irrelevant until the human beings can thrive again. Until they can eat daily. Until someone can just live in peace.
So if you and I really care, brothers and sisters, we need to respond humanitarianly. We need to respond. Do something, anything. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Remember that at least we can make dua. When I say at least, actually it's the most powerful thing we can do. Is make dua for that human being. By the way, you see someone really driving out of here today and you see someone standing at the traffic light and you snub that person. Just think for a second, even whether you give or you don't give, not the point. But that Allah created that human being too. And Allah does not create junk. I hate to be so frank because often we literally would not even look at the human being. At this smile, it's Salah. At least in the quietness of your car while the windows are rolled up because you don't want to look at the person. At least make a dua for that human being, Allah's creation. Regardless of race, religion, nationality, ethnicity. Be a humanitarian. Be a human being again. We get so caught up in our intellectual stuff, our conversation, whatever. Thing, we forget about the heart, the human being. So if you cannot donate to projects, make dua. If you can donate, you can. I thought about it the other day. I was looking at my cupboard. And I see clothing in my cupboard. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, there's probably clothing in here that I may never wear. I mean, what I mean by that? I may die today. Which means this clothing in my cupboard is actually for someone else. Have you ever thought about it? You probably have money in your pocket right now that you may never use. I could leave here today and my time is up. That means I have money in my wallet that I will not use. Someone else will. It means I'm just, it's just passing through. I probably have clothing in my cupboard I will never wear. Somebody else is going to wear it. The clothing doesn't care who wears it. It's irrelevant. But you and I hoard so much. We forget that if we let it flow to another human being, may Allah let His mercy and barakah flow through to us. The more we hold it, it becomes toxic. Water that is stagnant becomes toxic. But water that is flowing is fresh and has barakah in it. To, to, to wrap up, brothers and sisters, currently through African Muslims Agency, we bought over 100 boreholes in Afghanistan because water is such a dire need. We support over five bakeries for daily bread. Daily bread every single day. Orphans and widows come to collect bread. At least they get some food every single day from those bakeries. So they don't have to sell themselves and allow themselves to be abused for food. And I hate to be so graphic and frank, but that is the fact. When a 12-year-old girl, I mean 12-year-olds that get married, the parents sell them off to get married, sell them to get married to much older men. You and I can debate over oh, that's their, I've heard people tell me, but you know, that's their culture. So the 12 year old ends up getting married, getting sold because the father can't afford it to a 50, 60 year old man in today's world. And our argument, but that's their culture. Human being. I met a mother in Lebanon, we'll visit her in Shalva next week again. Three daughters, 17 year old, 12 year old and a 7 year old. 17 year old and the 7 year old were laying on the floor, the 12 year old was going to ask, where's the 12 year old? No, she can't afford to keep these children, so she let the 12 year old get married. So the 17 year old and 7 year old, why are they still with her? Because they, they lay in a fetus formation, because they were born with a birth defect. So they can't move. And she literally said to us, she said, sometimes when I look at my daughters, I think about just creating two pieces of meat. Children go to work every single day in places like this. But in South Africa too, by the way. There are many parts of rural South Africa that this happens. And being a humanitarian has nothing to do with charity. It's got nothing to do with money. It's got to do with what's in our heart first. If you feel for another human being, that's being a humanitarian already. And then from there, smile, make dua, and then donate if you can. And especially in these times when we all fear our loss of income, we fear our loss of jobs, we fear the, the economic crisis, we fear companies closing down. When you fear, that's when we're really being tested. 
Because when we have it in abundance, it's easy to give. When we feel like we're going to lose, it's harder to give. But it's at that time when we should be giving and trust Allah. And even, I mean, I do these crazy things. I just, and I'm sure you do too. You, you, don't, want, you, don't, you don't want you want to admit it publicly. But I just speak to Allah like, Allah, listen, I don't know how I'm going to survive. So I'm giving this because you, I want more. Like, you're going to give me more. Because I've got a family to feed too. <coughs> and Allah promises in the Quran, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِرُ For those of you who have taqwa, God-fearing, God-consciousness, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Allah will open up a way. وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِرُ will give you risk, sustenance. And risk is not only money, by the way. Sometimes money is the least of the things we would want if we really understood what risk is. Because you and I know you can have money in your life but no baraka. You could have less, less and lots of baraka and you feel different. So, وَمَا يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَةً وَيَزُقُّ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ And Allah give you risk from places you never imagined. Imagine the creator of everything says, I will give you risk from places you never imagined. It means everything you and I can imagine beyond that. Why wouldn't we want to trust Allah's word? I wrap up and make it go out for every single one of you in your families. I will bless every single one of you. I will grant you immense barakah. May Allah grant you barakah more than you ever could think of. But may Allah grant you the humility to understand that it may just be passing through you to someone else. And let's let it pass through us as quickly as possible so that we may earn the, 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 the rahmah and the maghfirah and the barakah from Allah instead of hold it because when Allah takes us, it will still go to somewhere else. So it's going to go whether we like it or not. Let's be the conduit for which it goes, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's South Africa, whether it's to orphans, whether it's to widows, whether it's to bacon projects, whether it's to your neighbor. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ وَرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ شُكْرًا وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ